Shall we bow our heads? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege of being in your house. We thank you for the awesome privilege of opening up your holy book, the book of Genesis and the book of Revelation to study about that select group, the 144,000. We ask that your Holy Spirit will guide us in our study today and help us to learn the lessons which will be useful in our own personal walk with Jesus. And we thank you Lord for hearing our prayer for we ask it in Jesus name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And we want to read verses 10 through 13. Revelation 21 and verses 10 to 13. Here the New Jerusalem is being described and it says this, And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also she had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. We find here a description of the New Jerusalem. And what I want you to notice as we begin our study is that the New Jerusalem has twelve gates. And on each gate is one of the names of the twelve sons of Jacob. Now the question is, what are those names? We're not told in the passage that we just read. So we must go to Revelation chapter 7 and verses 1 through 8. Revelation chapter 7 and verses 1 through 8. Here we find in the first three verses a description of the great tribulation which is soon to come upon the world. It says in verse 1, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. By the way, when the winds are released, that's the tribulation. It's the period of the plagues. Time of trouble such as never has been seen in the history of the world. Verse 2, Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted, to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. I want you to notice here that the reason for the sealing is to identify those who are going to go through the tribulation so that their lives are preserved, their lives are spared. That's the reason why it says, Before the winds are released, seal my servants on their foreheads. In other words, it is a mark of protection upon God's people who will go through the tribulation when the winds of strife are released. And then I want you to notice who are the ones that receive the seal. Verse 4, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So now we're going to notice the names of the individuals that are found on the doors that we read about in Revelation chapter 21. Verse 5, of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 
twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, twelve thousand were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, twelve thousand were sealed. The names of the sons of Jacob, which later became the tribes of Israel. Now there's a critical question that we need to ask before we move on to study about the 144,000. And that is, when will the 144,000 live in the history of the world? There's no doubt whatsoever folks, as we examine the book of Revelation, that the 144,000 are those who will be alive when Jesus comes. You say, how do we know that? Well, let's go back to chapter 6, and we'll notice that very clearly. Revelation 6, and I would like to begin at verse 15. It says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us! and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Now what event is being described in these verses? There's no doubt that it's talking about the second coming of Christ. That's the great day of His wrath. Now my question is, who will live during this period of the outpouring of God's wrath? The answer is in the very next chapter where we read from. It says there that the winds of strife are being held until the servants of God are sealed on their foreheads. So when the question is asked, who shall be able to stand? The answer is those who have received what? Those who have received the seal of God. So when Jesus comes and he manifests his wrath according to the book of Revelation. The only ones who will be able to stand are the 144,000 who have the names of all of the sons of Jacob of the tribes of Israel. Now we need to ask the question, who are these 144,000? Are we dealing here with literal Jews is this God's final plan for the literal Jewish nation where He's going to rescue literal people from the literal tribes of Israel? Or is this referring to spiritual Israelites who have the characteristics of the sons of Jacob who later became the tribes of Israel? Well, what we need to do to answer this question is examine what the New Testament means by the word Israel. Obviously these people are going to be saved because in the day of the wrath of the Lamb they are going to be able to stand. They're sealed with the seal of God. They're going to be saved in other words. Now if they're going to be saved and they are Israel we need to understand what Israel means in the New Testament. Go with me to Romans chapter 2 and verses 28 and 29. Romans 2, 28 and 29. Let's identify Israel. It says here, the Apostle Paul speaking, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Notice that a Jew is not necessarily one who has been circumcised. Verse 29. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Who is Israel according to this passage? Israel is composed of those who have circumcised hearts. 
who have been converted to Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. That is true Israel. Now go with me to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, further emphasizing this point. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. It says here, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, who is Christ? Who is the only true seed of Abraham? Christ. The promises were not made to seeds, but to the seed, Jesus Christ. Now you say, well that excludes all of us. No it doesn't. Notice chapter 3 and verses 27 and 29. Galatians chapter 3 verses 27 and 29. Here we find the Apostle Paul saying this, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Verse 29, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Who are the children of Abraham according to this verse? The children of Abraham are those who belong to whom? To Christ. In other words, Israel is not defined by the blood we have, by the place we live, or by the surname we possess. Israel is defined as those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Which is a spiritual relationship. In other words, you can not be a literal Jew and still, according to the Bible, be a Jew. You cannot be a literal Israelite and yet still be Israel because Israel is defined spiritually, it is not defined physically and literally. Would this apply to the 144,000? Obviously, the 144,000, by the New Testament definition, are not those literal Israelites, but they are spiritual Israelites who have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Notice also Romans chapter 9 and verses 6 through 8. Romans chapter 9 and verses 6 through 8. The Apostle Paul could not be any clearer than he is in this passage. He says this, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Did you notice this, that not all Israelites are Israelites? Not all Jews are Jews, according to the definition of the Apostle Paul? Who are Jews? Who is Israel? Notice verse 7. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Notice that just because you're the literal seed of Abraham, you're not a child of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, notice, those who are the children of the flesh, that is literal Jews, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as seed. We could go to other places in the New Testament. I'll just mention the Gospel of John in passing. John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking with the Jews. And he says, uh, I know that you're Abraham's children. I know that you're Abraham's seed. But then he goes on to say, I know that you're really not Abraham's seed. Because Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he was glad. But you want to kill me. And so even though you are literally children of Abraham, by wanting to kill me, manifesting a different spirit than Abraham, you show that you are not really children of Abraham. So Israel in the New Testament is defined relationally to Jesus Christ, which means that the 144,000 are not literal Jews, they are Jews in the sense that the New Testament uses the word Jew, the word Israel. They are spiritual Israelites who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12 which we already read, but I want you to notice here another interesting detail. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 12. 
it says here also she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates did you notice this that the gates are not just open and vacant the gates have what? an angel at each gate and I believe that what they're doing is checking ID to make sure that you're going through the right gate we'll come to that a little bit later on now the question is who will be allowed by the angels into the holy city Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12 has the answer Revelation chapter 22 and verse uh, 14 actually Revelation 22 and verse 14 it says blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city who is allowed to go into the city through the gates? those who what? those who keep his commandments who allows them in? the angels who are standing at the gates but now we have a serious problem let me ask you this, were the sons of Jacob sinners? were they pretty wicked? allow me to tell you something about the twelve sons of Jacob the names that are immortalized on the doors of the city the sons of Jacob were filled with covetousness and envy they coveted Joseph's position they were envious because his father gave him a coat of many colors they were liars in fact they lived a lie for years and years telling their father that Joseph had been killed by a wild beast and they hid this lie for years they were murderers they were filled with hatred and by the way the Bible says that hatred is murder he who hates his brother is a murderer according to 1st John and so you have them hating their own brother you have them having a murderous spirit in fact when they saw Joseph coming they said and Simeon and Levi were probably the main culprits they said let's kill our brother our own flesh and blood not only this they were cold-blooded killers and thieves I don't know whether you're aware of the story that we find uh, in Genesis uh, about uh, Shechem Genesis 34 has the story just so happens that the, these twelve brothers had one sister her name was Dinah and Dinah went with some of her friends uh, to Shechem and there Shechem who was the son of the king uh, actually had sexual relations with their sister and she uh, conceived a child and of course uh, Shechem the Bible says loved Dinah with all of his heart and he wanted to get married with her so he contacted Jacob and he said you know uh, my son ja uh, uh, my son Shechem wants to marry your daughter Dinah and uh, when Simeon and Levi heard about this they said this cannot go unpunished and so what they did they, they prepared a very special plot they said to all of the men of Shechem we cannot allow our sister to marry an uncircumcised man if you will be circumcised and all of the men of Shechem are circumcised then we'll allow, you, allow Shechem to get married to Dinah and so they were circumcised and when they were in the third day which is the moment of greatest pain from circumcision Simeon and Levi went to the city of Shechem and they killed every single one of the men that were in that town and not only that they also went in and they plundered and they stole everything that belonged to the inhabitants of Shechem that's the kind of individuals that these men were and then you have Reuben who slept with his father's wife Bilhah that's called incest and then you have the merciless and mean spiritedness when Joseph is crying out please don't sell me they have no mercy no compassion whatsoever 
And then of course you have uh, Reuben who, who has the backbone of a jellyfish. You know when they throw Joseph into, into the pit. Reuben should have said this is wrong. He was the oldest brother. This cannot go. Let him go. But he didn't. He worked and said well you know I'll go and I'll take him out of the pit after the anger calms down and when my brothers leave. And when he came back he had already been sold. And by the way, you also have Judah lying with his daughter-in-law thinking that she was a prostitute. That's amazing. You have all of these children from four mothers all living under the same roof. In other words, this was a totally dysfunctional family. I mean, with a dysfunctional lifestyle. Totally almost corrupt. Not totally because they changed later on. And yet their names stand immortalized forever on the gates of the new Jerusalem. You can imagine the wicked outside the city saying, Oh, you left us outside because we're liars. What about those whose names are on the doors, on the gates? Oh, you cast us out here because we're thieves. What about them? Oh, you left us out here because we're murderers. What about them? In other words, those who are inside were just as much sinners as those who were outside. At least at one stage in their lives. So how could the sons of Jacob have their names immortalized on the gates of the holy city, the new Jerusalem? the book of Revelation has the answer it is true that they were vile sinners but the book of Revelation emphasizes that they were overcomers they overcame their sins they overcame their defects they gained the victory over all of these besetments in their lives notice Revelation chapter 21 Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7 on this point Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7 it says here he who what overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son he who overcomes what notice verse 8 the contrast of those who are outside the city it says but the cowardly unbelieving abominable murderers sexually immoral sorcerers idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death who is inside the city the what the overcomers overcomers over what it has to be over what is mentioned in verse 8 in verse 8 you have a list of sins and transgressions which are violations of the Ten Commandments and those who are outside never overcame these things but those who are inside the Bible says that they overcame notice Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7 by the way this is a formula that is used after every single church there's seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 after every single church is mentioned you have this formula it says there in Revelation 2 and verse 7 he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches to him who what? who overcomes I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God what is the condition for eating from the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God it means to what to overcome by the way if we compare with that the verse that we read a few moments ago Revelation 22 verse 14 it says blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life so what does it mean to overcome if we compare these two verses overcoming means to obey his what it means to obey his holy law 
unless you wonder about this, notice Revelation 22 and verse 15 which comes immediately after saying that those who keep the commandments will be allowed through the gates into the city to partake of the tree of life it says in verse 15 but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So what have we seen so far? First of all we've seen that the New Jerusalem has twelve gates and inscribed on each gate is the name of one of the sons of Jacob. We found that the 144,000 are composed of those who have those names of the tribes and we've discovered that the 144,000 are those who are going to be alive when Jesus Christ comes and they're going to be preserved by the seal of the living God we've noticed that they're not literal Jews because the New Testament definition of a Jew or of Israel is one who has accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord no matter what nation they come from we've noticed that at the gates there will be angels guiding the people through the gates we've noticed that those who go through the gates are overcomers they are overcomers of all of the list of sins that are mentioned concerning those who are outside the holy city no matter how vile, how evil, how bad people have been the final generation will be a generation of victorious people who will overcome every defect of character whether it is inherited or whether it is cultivated they will gain the victory and they will remain firm to God by the way go with me to Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2 and I want you to notice that this group is going to live in the world in the worst period of its history Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2 it says here, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory, notice that, who have the victory over whom? over the beast, over his image, over his mark and over the number of his name by the way are these the end time saints? when is it that the beast is going to manifest his power? when is it that the image of the beast is going to be erected? when is it that the mark of the beast is going to be imposed on pain of death? is that at the very end of human history? most certainly yes and it says that they were standing on the sea of glass having the harps of God they have overcome they are victorious they have washed their garments we're going to notice in the blood of the Lamb and they have gained the victory over sin in their lives now I want you to notice a very interesting detail which I did not underline yet in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 14 Revelation 22 and verse 14 I don't know whether you've ever stopped to think about this but let me ask you is everybody going to enter through the same gate? there's twelve gates right? so is everybody going to enter through the same gate? no, notice Revelation 22 and verse 14 it says blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the what? through the gates into the city, plural so are different people going to enter through different gates? obviously yes because you're not going to enter through all twelve you're going to enter through one now the question is through which gate will you enter? through which gate will I enter? what will determine which gate we will go through? I believe we have the answer in Genesis 49 go with me to Genesis 49 and I want to read verses 1 and 2 Genesis 49 and verses 1 and 2 here Jacob gathers his sons together and he's going to pronounce his final blessing upon them before he dies but he is also going to predict 
what their characters are going to produce in the last days. Notice Genesis 49 verses 1 and 2. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together, that I may tell you what shall befall you when? In the last days. Let me ask you, were they going to be literally alive in the last days? Were the sons of Jacob going to be literally alive in the last days? Of course not. So what does this mean? I will show you what will, what will happen to you or what will befall you in the latter days. It's talking about the influence of their lives and people who have the similar characters to the characters that they possessed. And then notice verse 2, Gather together and hear you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel your father. You know it's very common for people today to speak about four personality profiles. They've got it wrong, they've got to mu multiply four times three. Because there are not four personality profiles, there are actually twelve personality profiles. I've done an extensive study of the names of the sons of Jacob and also all their trajectory through scripture and I've discovered beyond a shadow of a doubt that each one of the sons of Jacob had a character different than the other one. They had different shades or variations in their character, in their way of being. And what God is trying to say is that in the end time there's going to be in the world twelve different personality profiles, twelve different types of persons, and your personality profile will, will determine through which gate in the holy city you go through. If you have the personality for, for example of Simeon or Levi who would lose it real fast, they had a short fuse, and they said, hey, let's, let's just kill Joseph, because according to Jewish tradition, the ones that came up with the idea of killing Joseph were Simeon and Levi. They also were the masterminds in killing all of the men of Shechem. I mean, these were bloodthirsty killers. There's going to be people in the world that have that type of character. There are going to be people like Reuben, who had the backbone of a jellyfish always contemporizing and saying, no, I'll take care of it later. Procrastinators, who perhaps don't stand for truth at the moment that they're supposed to. And I could go through each one of the sons of Jacob. Each one of them has a personality profile which will be shared by people who live on planet earth in the end time. But the important thing is that no matter what the personality profile every single one of those who enter through the gates into the city will eventually be overcomers. They will overcome the defects in their character and they will develop the strengths of their character and they will overcome the deficiencies and the weaknesses of their characters. And like the twelve sons of Jacob are inscribed upon the doors of the city, they will go through the gates into the city to partake of the tree of life. There is no sin there is no besetment, whether inherited or cultivated, that cannot be overcome. In fact, the sons of Jacob are an inspiration to us. I mean, how much more vile could you become than sleeping with your father's mother? How much more vile than to visit a prostitute and sleeping with your daughter-in-law? How much more vile could you be than to want to kill your own brother? How much more vile could you become than being so bloodthirsty that you would want to kill a whole town of people because they had sexual relations with your sister? And yet their names are inscribed on the gates of the holy city. Wow! If that's not comforting to you, I don't know what would be comforting. No matter how evil and how wicked we are, if we overcome through the power of Jesus who overcame, we will be able to go through one of the gates into the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and partake of the tree of life. But we're talking not about literal Reubenites and literal Levites. We're talking about spiritual Israelites who have the same types of character as the original sons of Jacob. 
It's interesting to notice that in the list of the sons of Jacob that are found in Revelation chapter 7, two of them are missing. The first one that is missing is Dan. Dan. The second one that is missing is Ephraim. You say, why would Dan and Ephraim be missing? The Bible explains why Ephraim is not there. There's a declaration of God where he says, Ephraim is joined to his idols. Leave him alone. What a terrible declaration. He totally identified himself or his descendants with idolatry. What about Dan? Go with me to Genesis chapter 49 and verse 17. One of the worst characteristics that a person could have. You see, Dan, Dan's name is not inscribed on one of the gates of the holy city because of his traits, trait of character. And anyone who has that trait of character will not go through a gate into the city. Because Dan is not there. And you say, what was this trait, this evil trait of character? It says in Genesis 49 verse 17, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path, that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backwards. In other words, Dan was of those types that become a stumbling block to people. He was a backbiter. And by the way, there's a text in Psalm 104 that interrelates the idea of lying the tongue and backbiting. Like it says here in Genesis 49 and verse 17. There will be no Ephraimites. There will be no Danites in the holy city. Because you know that sin originated with one who was a liar about God. One who was a backbiter. One who worked underground. One who led a third of the angels to betray their trust to God. There will be no people who have the character like Dan. There will be no one who has the character like Ephraim. Now let's go back once again to Revelation 22 and verse 14. It says, Blessed are those that keep His commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Now, some of you might have some versions of the Bible that express this verse differently. For example, the NIV will say, not blessed are those who keep His commandments, but many of the modern versions, in fact most of them say, blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter through the gates into the city. Now the question is, what is the correct translation? Is the correct translation, wash their robes or keep the commandments? The fact is, folks, that we don't have to choose between one and the other. I believe that the best translation is keep His commandments, by the way. I believe that that can be proven by studying the ancient manuscripts, by studying the context and the relationship between this verse and Genesis chapters 1 and 2. I have no doubts whatsoever. But just for the sake of argument, it doesn't really make that much difference because in the book of Revelation, both expressions are used elsewhere. Notice Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14. It's speaking about that great multitude of redeemed that no one can number from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And it says there in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14, And I said to him, he's speaking to one of the elders, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Is the idea of washing the robes and making the robes white in the blood of the Lamb contained in the book of Revelation? It most certainly is. And by the way, washing our garments in the blood of the Lamb simply means two things. Number one, it means that we accept Jesus as our justification. In other words, we receive Jesus as our Savior and He looks upon us as if we never sinned. On our ledger in heaven, He writes, forgiven. 
We are accepted in the beloved. Not on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of what Jesus did. When we accept Him, our slate is clean. But we can't stop there. Because from a justified life flows also what? A sanctified life. In other words, when Jesus wipes our slate clean and He looks upon us as if we had never sinned, it will be our delight and our joy to keep the commandments of God. Because we love God. And so in Revelation we find the expression, blessed are those who wash their robes. But the expression, blessed are those who keep the commandments, are also, is also used in Revelation. You're all acquainted with Revelation 12 verse 17? where it says that the dragon was wroth with the woman or enraged with the woman and went, meant, went to make war with the remnant of her seed who what? who keep the commandments of God see the idea? wash their robes, keep the commandments we also have Revelation 14 verse 12 which is the concluding verse of God's last message to the world the three angels messages it says here is the patience of the saints here are they who what? who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So both ideas are there. If your garments have been washed in the blood of the Lamb the natural consequence will be to what? to keep the commandments of God. Let me ask you the twelve sons of Jacob, the ones that are mentioned on the gates of the city, the sons of Israel were those individuals sins cleansed by the blood of the Lamb? were they? were they given a clean slate? must be because their names would not be inscribed forever on the gates of the city unless their sins, all of the evil deeds that they performed had been cleaned away but let me ask you, did their lives also change? their lives must have changed because they were overcomers, we read it they were not like those outside the holy city we read a long list of sins that characterizes those outside the city those inside will be different than these notice Revelation 22 and verse 11 very interesting verse, it's describing the close of human probation Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11 and unfortunately the King James Version and the New King James does not capture the full meaning of certain words that I'm going to describe. Revelation 22 and verse 11 says, He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. It gives the impression that uh, being unjust is, is a state in which you're found. Actually the Greek word should be translated, He who is unjust let him act unjustly still. It has to do not with a state of being but with action. And then it says, and he who is filthy let him be filthy still. In the Greek really it says, he who is filthy let him continue to act filthily. I know there's not such a word. He who is righteous let him be righteous still in the Greek it says, he who is righteous, let him con to continue to act righteously. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. The Greek says, he who is holy, let him to con continue to act in a holy manner. In other words, those who live in the final generation will not only be characterized by their intellectual belief in Jesus, they will not be characterized by their sins being washed away in justification but they will act differently they will act in a holy manner they will act in a just manner their faith will be shown by their works now notice Isaiah 26 verses 1 to 3 Isaiah 26 and verses 1 to 3 we have this wonderful passage which is related to what we're studying in Revelation chapter uh, 7 and chapter 14 notice in that day this song will be sung in the land of Judah we have a strong city God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks and now notice verse 2 open the gates 
Is that related to what we read in Revelation? Certainly. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. What will the character of those who enter in the gates be like? It says here, open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in and you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. As the Apostle Paul says in Colossians, or Colossians chapter 3 and verses 1 and 2, he says, set your mind on the things above, not your mind on the things below. You know, one author has said that if we could catch one glimpse of heaven, we would never want to live on planet earth again. Why not then place our minds in heaven? Because that's going to be our permanent home. We focus so much on this world, the things of this world, the houses of this world, the money of this world, our automobiles, our toys. We focus so much on this world as if this is going to last forever. We're living in the last days, folks. And God wants to separate for Himself a holy people. Now notice Psalm 15. Let's go to Psalm 15, where the, these 144,000 are described. Psalm 15, and I'm going to read the whole psalm because it's not very long. It says there the following, Psalm 15. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? What is God's holy hill? Zion. Where do the 144,000 stand? On what mount? Mount Zion, Revelation 14 verse 1. So who is going to abide in his tabernacle? Who is going to dwell on his holy hill? Notice the answer. He who walks uprightly. He who works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue. That's why Revelation says that the 144,000, there is no lie found, found on their mouths. He who does not backbite with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change, he who does not put out his money at usury. That means at excessive interest. Nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. Now notice, he who does these things shall never be moved. Revelation 6 says, who shall be able to what? To stand. Psalm 15 says that those who practice these things will not be moved. So the 144,000 are going to have a sterling character. Now go with me to Isaiah 60 and verse 18. Isaiah 60 and verse 18. I want you to notice something very interesting which is said about the gates. It says there, Violence shall no longer be heard in your land neither wasting nor destruction within your borders. But you shall call your walls salvation and your gates, what? And your gates, praise. And by the way, if you read Revelation chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, it speaks about a great multitude that are singing in heaven. A multitude which no one can number. They're singing praises and honor and glory to God because He has saved them from final destruction at the end of time. Now by the way, Revelation 21 and verse 21 tells us that each gate is one pearl. Each gate is one what? One pearl. Those must be some massive pearls. Is there anything more beautiful than a pearl? 
I've seen many precious gems. I, I can't see anything more beautiful than a pearl. You see all of the colors of the rainbow. It's beautiful. Imagine a gate of a city where the city, uh, where, where, you know, the, the wall of the city is as tall as its width and its breadth. That's some door. Now why would God make the gates of pearl? Do you know how a pearl is formed? A pearl is formed as a result of an irritant which uh, is planted in the, in the shell of the mother of pearl. There's an irritant, a grain of sand or something, then the, uh, begins a secretion that starts forming the pearl. What is God trying to tell us? that if we're going to enter heaven, it must be what? through many what? through many irritations in fact that's what Paul meant in Acts 14 verse 22 where he says that we must understand that, it's, that it's, it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God there are many irritants in our lives but if we use those irritants to gain strength and to draw, draw closer to Jesus we can make something beautiful out of these tribulations and trials in our lives and we will finally en enter through the gates of pearl. Finally I ask the question who are the only ones who are going to dwell in heavenly society? I'm just going to mention these verses in closing. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. What are the rest going to do? Do you notice Revelation 6? What are those who are not pure in heart going to do? They're going to hide in the caves and they're going to beg for the rocks to fall upon them and hide them from the face that is of the one that is sitting upon the throne. But it says, Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Hebrews 12 verse 14 says that we need to be at peace with all men and we need to develop holiness without which no one will see the Lord. You see folks there's a special preparation of character that needs to take place in order for us to be able to stand. In order for us to stand like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego before the image of Nebuchadnezzar, the image of the beast so to speak and say we will not worship no matter what you can throw us in the furnace but our heart is set in God in order for that to happen folks we need to make everything in this world secondary in our relationship to God primary 1st John 3 says that everybody who has this hope in him the hope of the coming of Jesus purifies himself even as he is pure what do we do? if we have the hope of the coming of Jesus we purify ourselves. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 he says that God wants a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You say, Pastor that's impossible. It's not impossible. If you believe that it's impossible then you have to say that Philippians 4 verse 13 says I can do almost all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do most things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do some things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what the text says. The text says I can do all things except overcome sin through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what the text says. The text says He who is able to keep you from falling. The end time generation will be a generation totally victorious over sin washed by the blood of the Lamb in justification and living a sanctified holy life. Which means that our dress will be holy. It means that our entertainment will be holy. It means that our worship will be holy. It means that our music will be holy. It means that everything that we do and say will have a holy focus. 
because 144,000 are found without guile or spot before the throne of God. I'd like to end by referring to one individual that we find in Genesis who experienced before the fact what the righteous living are going to experience when Jesus comes. His name was what? Enoch. Notice Genesis chapter 5 and I would like to read verse 22. Genesis 5, actually verse 24. It says in verse 24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God what? Took him. What did Enoch do before he went to heaven? He walked with God. Now go with me to another text, the book of Hebrews, quickly, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. It explains a little bit more what it meant for Enoch to walk with God. It says in verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him for before he was taken he had this testimony that he pleased God. To walk with God is to please God and the Apostle Paul tells us that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. How about we make pleasing God our first priority?